Welcome to this online version of my talk on the fossils of Folkestone. Here is a map of the main fossil collecting area at Folkestone. On this slide you can see some of the kit which is really useful when collecting fossils down at Folkestone. This is a map of the geology of the area. We're on what we call the Wealdon Anticline, which is a fold in rocks. And this was actually formed due to Africa colliding with Europe. So Africa's actually moving northwards. The whole continent of Africa is moving northwards very slowly and it's compressing the rocks of Europe and creating folds and faults in the rocks. Here we can see the three main rock types that you'll, you will see at Folkestone. There's the lower green sand on the bottom and the chalk is on the top and in between is the gold clay. And uh, it's important to remember that usually the oldest rocks are at the bottom and the youngest rocks are at the top. If you want to learn more about the underlying geology of this area, then I thoroughly recommend checking out British Geological Surveys by Geology app or on their website, their online maps pages, because you can actually see what kinds of rocks are right underneath your house, for example. And you can also look at boreholes, which tell us more about what rocks are deeper down, the ones that we can't see at the surface. One particular borehole was made in the late 1800s after operations to build a channel tunnel between Britain and Europe were suspended due to security fears. So this is the late 1800s. And because the, the people working on it were, didn't have anything else to do, they set them to work to investigate the geology. So they did some boreholes. And in this one, they discovered that there was actually coal, carboniferous coal, underneath the other rocks that we can see at the surface at Folkestone and this led to the development of the Kent coal mining industry. So this chart here shows what rocks we've got at Folkestone. We've got the ones at the surface and these are between around 80 to 120 million years old, give or take a million years or so. And underneath we've got these other rocks that we can't see at the surface but we're no, we know that they're there because of the boreholes. And so we've got Jurassic rocks as well. We've got everything from the Kimmeridge clay right down to the liars. And at the bottom, of course, we've got these coal measures. And there was actually a coal mine at Shakespeare Colliery near, near to Folkestone, um, which didn't actually produce much coal, but other collieries were much more successful in Kent. Now let's have a look at some of the fossils you can find at Folkestone. We've got lots of bivalves, including the ubiquitous Trigonia at number three. There's also several, probably dozens of species of gastropod. Quite a few of these are actually very similar to the ones that you find in the gold clay as well. And of course we have lots of different kinds of ammonites. On the bottom here is an ammonite called Otohoplites waltoni, which is actually named after one of the previous curators at Folkestone Museum, John Walton, who was curator there back in the 1920s. One of the coolest ammonites you'll find at Folkestone in the green sand is Duvelisserus, and there's a few different species, the main one being Duvelisserus mammalatum, which the mammalatum zone is made. A zone is a specific set of layers of rocks which is used for biostratigraphy. One of the reasons why ammonites are really useful for biostratigraphy is because they only occur in very specific layers but each species is limited to, to a certain set of layers so we can use them to work out the relative ages of rocks across the world and on the right here we've got a specimen from Madagascar so these ammonites and many others are found across vast areas of the globe We also get occasionally rare specimens of crustaceans, 
Um, we hope to find some crabs one day. We've only found bits of lobsters so far. Here are some fossil fish remains. We've got some little vertebrae or, and um, possibly some fish teeth and some shark's teeth. And we've also got the jawbones from a sheen steer, formerly known as lepidotes. And we've also got this um, part of a jaw of a chimeroid, which was a cartilaginous fish on the top left there. We also have occasional dinosaur bones even, and more about dinosaurs later. This one may be from an ankylosaur, but we're not really sure yet. Here's a fossil coprolite, which is a fossilised poo. And you can see this on display at Folkestone Museum. Here on this page, we've got some trace fossils. So trace fossils are the remains of the evidence of the activity of ancient life. So animals making burrows, things walking around, making trackways, or potentially things like bite marks in bones and shell. Here are some strange structures, which turned out to be dinosaur footprints, which I found in 2011. That they weren't supposed to be there because the green sand was supposed to be a marine formation. It was laid down, we thought, in entirely marine conditions. But the fact we found these footprints suggests it's actually more complicated than that. One of the interesting things about these particular footprints is that they're didactyl, so there's only sort of two toes. But um, there are other dinosaur footprints there as well. So here we have a tridactyl dinosaur footprint from the green sand. So this has got three toes, tri meaning three, of course. So this one yeah, really nails it. There are definitely dinosaur footprints at Folkestone. Here's another much larger tridactyl footprint. We think this would have been made by an iguanodontid. So you've probably heard of iguanodon. So the dinosaur that made this would have looked something like what we what we see as iguanodon so quite large and the key thing about these footprints is to you can tell that they're not from a theropod because they're wider than they are long theropod footprints are longer than they are wide usually and here's a picture of steve Friedrich with a theropod footprint that he found so this one is slightly longer than it is wide and this one you can also see at Folkestone Museum, along with the first tridactyl footprint that I showed you. Now, these are what we think might be sand spherules made by prehistoric bubbler crabs. But um, there's some work that needs to be done to prove whether this is the case, because bubbler crabs are only supposed to have appeared during the Miocene, some 30 million years ago or so. And, and these rocks are around 120 million years old. So if bubbler crabs were around back then then that uh, extends their their time period by around sort of 80 to 90 million years so but if we're right this is important evidence of a tidal environment because bubbler crabs they feed on sand on during low tides this is actually one of the fossil crabs from the gold clay but this is what i think the bubbler crabs from that time would have looked like. And here's a view of a large sort of area of these sand spherules. And because they're so consistent and restricted in size to less than a centimetre, this suggests to me that there's something biological and not something mineralogical. To understand a bit better the environment that the lower green sand at Folkestone was deposited in, I did some sampling. And here I've got a sample of the upper Folkestone beds, and these sand grains have what seems to be frosting. And frosting is what you'd expect where you have sand which is being blown around by wind and kind of bounce the sand grains bouncing off each other and creating little pits and creating this frosting effect. So this suggests that we had wind blown sand during periods of time when when these rocks were being deposited so as well as evidence of tides in terms of not just the footprints we've got 
evidence of windblown sand, so perhaps at times the sea level was low enough for sand dunes to form. And on the right here, we've got some sand from the beach at Folkestone, which has been washed by the sea. And this is different in that it's shiny. So this shows the, the difference between wind washed sand or wind, wind abraded sand and water washed sand. Now let's have a look at some fossils from the Galt clay. And the Galt is very different. It's definitely an entirely marine formation. Here's a draw of fossils at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. These are ammonites from the Galt clay. Here are some Galt clay trace fossils. And I should say, I call it, keep calling it the Galt clay. It's actually officially known as the Galt formation, but Folkestone, it's a clay, so we call it the Galt clay. And uh, one of the best ones, I think, is this ammonite on the bottom right here which has teeth marks where it's been attacked by probably a fish. You can see this one at Folkestone Museum. Here's uh, some of my favourite fossils that we'll find at Folkestone. These are the fossilised crabs. Is an example of rare colour preservation in some bivalves from the Galt. Um, actually, it's really not that rare, but it's rare to find a good one that's, that's um, easy to preserve. The Galt is perhaps most famous, of course, for its ammonites with their original mother of pearl shells preserved. You also get some really quite rare but spectacular fossil fish specimens from the Galt. And this is, these are some from the museum and these are actually arguably the best fossil fish from the Galt that you will find in the country, even perhaps better than the ones that you'll find at the Natural History Museum. This is one of my favourite finds that I've made. This is a fossil turtle skull and you can see this at Folkestone Museum. This is the neck bone from a pterosaur, so part of the backbone, and probably from something called Nithicyrus, something like that. And this one is now at the National Museum's Liverpool. When you're collecting, one thing that's important to do is to, if you can, identify which particular layer you find a fossil in. And you can do this by looking at the different characteristics and referring to the literature. So bed six in particular has this sort of light grey colour with mottling. Bed 7 is much darker and then other beds have different characteristics as well. So bed 8 which is above bed 7 for example that has two very distinct bands of nodules with lots of fossils in it. So let's have a look at some fossils from the chalk. This is the glauconitic mole and this represents the start of the deposition of the chalk and Unlike the rest of the chalk that we know is very white usually, this is very, very dark, almost black. And we actually think that this could be partly made of volcanic ash. But um, more research to be done on this. We know for certain that there were volcanoes not too far away. There was a failed rift system in the what is now the North Sea. And uh, this you know, obviously didn't last forever. Um, and it was around, around about the same time that the Atlantic was opening up. So there was rifting in more than one location at the time. Here's one of the famous large chalk ammonites called Parapazosia. This one from Andy Temple's collection. Here are a couple of examples of very rare but spectacularly preserved fossil starfish. And the one at the bottom there is at Folkestone Museum. Here is a fossilised ichthyosaur jaw, which again you can see at Folkestone Museum. Here is my reconstruction of the environment of the chalk, this uh, representing a scene at night time. So we've got some bivalves down here, Inosemurus as, as we call them. We've got a sea urchin, starfish, sponges and we've got some ammonites here, parapazosia probably. Uh, in the background here 
we've got some sharks chasing some fish. There were there were a lot of sharks swimming around at that time. Sometimes you find their teeth or even vertebrae. You can see some nice shark fossils at the museum as well as the ichthyosaur jaw. Here we've got a, a young ichthyosaur chasing some belemnites. As we know that ichthyosaurs like to eat belemnites. Surprisingly, perhaps, there are some fantastic fossils from the Pleistocene at Folkestone. So the Pleistocene is a period over the past two and a half million years. And we've got some fossils from the Ice Ages. So the Pleistocene was dominated by the Ice Ages. We've got fossils from cold periods, such as mammoth, and also fossils from warm periods, such as straight tusk elephant and even hippo. So this picture uh, represents the cold periods at Folkestone and there were mammoth wandering around a snowy tundra and probably just eat eating lots of grasses, things like that. And at the time there was of course a land bridge between Britain and the rest of Europe. Here are some fantastic Pleistocene fossils that you can see on display at Folkestone Museum. So we've got the mammoth from the cold periods. We've got woolly rhinoceros, we're probably around during the cold periods as well. And we also have straight tusk elephant teeth. The, these, this one is from quite a small straight tusk elephant, probably a juvenile. And this is about seven centimeters long. And these straight tusk elephants were around during warmer periods, a period called the Ipswichian. Most of the Pleistocene fossils at Folkestone Museum were actually part of a founding collection of the museum which was a fossil collection from Samuel Joseph Mackey and here's a couple of the bones from this particular collection we've got some hippo teeth some tusks and we've got a femur from hippo as well we also have as it turns out two tibias from what we think was the same hippo so we've got a left tibia and a right tibia and these were originally um, accession separately um, so they have different numbers um, but we pre we're pretty sure they're from the same hippo so it suggests we've got more articulated remains in the collection. So now we're going to have a look at some of the fossil collectors represented in Folkestone Museum collection. Here's a picture of the fossil display at Folkestone Museum, jam-packed the most well-known perhaps collector at Folkestone was John Griffiths. He was a fossil dealer and he sold fossils to not just Folkestone Museum, but also other museums around the world, including the Natural History Museum in London. And the Natural History Museum in London has got some fantastic specimens that he would have collected. And there are also specimens he collected at Bolton Museums, uh, Oxford University Museum of Natural History and many others, including the Cedric Museum in Cambridge. And one thing you'll notice is a distinctive style of preparation. There's these sort of squared off blocks of clay and um, and they're often, they are often very, very distinctive. And this one, of course, has got a label on the back. On the left here is a photograph of John with his wife, Rebecca. Here is one of John's famous fossil puddings, and we think he made these to sell to tourists using some of the less prized specimens, and they were placed into this cement, cement material and baked. Here is a photo of John and Rebecca's gravestone in the cemetery, which is opposite Morrison's in Folkestone, and uh, here's a little bit more information about him including that he found a dinosaur which was called Acanthopholis horrida, described by Henry Huxley, who was Darwin's bulldog. Another notable Folkestone fossil researcher was Dr. Raymond Casey, who described many ammonites from around the world, including many type specimens. And he did so much fantastic work that he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society. Sadly, I never got to meet him, but um, he started off as a volunteer at Folkestone Museum way back in the 1920s at the age of just 12. And he, he was mentored by the curator, John Walton. 
Here is a photo of a hands-on display at Folkestone Museum, which acts as a sort of tribute to Raymond Casey and John Griffiths. On the left, there's a 3D print of Ota Hoplites Waltonite, the Ammonite he described in honour of the curator John Walton. And the original Ammonites in the, the collection at the British Geological Survey. But you can find the three dimensional scans online and uh, you can download the data and have your own 3D print if you wish. And on the right from the same collection at the British Geological Survey is a 3D print of the part of the armour of Acanthopholis horrida, collected by John Griffiths. Another famous collector represented in the Folkestone Museum collection is Ethelred Bennett. And she is really one of the earliest known female geologists. And she actually wrote papers, she wrote peer-reviewed peer articles on fossilised sponges. But how do we know we've got some of her collection there? Well, we've got this fossil here, which has got one of her characteristic printed labels on which I found out about through a published article about her collection, most of which ended up at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. A large proportion of the fossils in Folkestone Museum would have been collected by Henry Bean Mackerson. Potentially also some of them might have been collected by his wife. And uh, he actually found the remains of a dinosaur at Hive, which is now in the Natural History Museum. And he was a pretty well-known amateur geologist and a fellow of the Geological Society. And his donation, um, well, his collection was donated by his wife in 1896, we think, because that's, um, that's what the accession records say. Here is a photo of one of the bones from Dinodocus Macassoni on the Natural History Museum's online collections pages. It um, was obviously collected by Henry Green Mackerson and ended up at that museum and it was described by Richard Owen who is famous as the man who coined the term dinosaur. Another interesting dinosaur relic is this plaster cast from the Guanodon tooth and actually we think that this may have been made by Gideon Mantell. Here's a photo from the Natural History Museum's online collections pages again. On the right here is the original tooth that we know that this cast was made from. It's also now pretty well established that it was Gideon Mantell's wife Mary who originally found the teeth. But why can we make this connection between that plaster cast of the tooth and Gideon Mantell? Well, we have this fossil of a plesiosaur bone in a pebble from Lyme Regis and it's got two labels on it one of which is Ethelred Bennett's label in the bottom right there and the top left we've got another label and I did some reading about Ethelred Bennett and I discovered that there was a quite a quite a strong relationship between the Mantells and Ethelred Bennett they met several times and they also exchanged fossils with each other so I theorised that this fossil had been sent to Ethelred Bennett by Gideon Mantell because in Gideon Mantell's diary he describes sending fossils in the post to Ethelred Bennett. There are also other labels that I have attributed to the Mantells in the Folkestone Museum collection based on comparisons with other labels in the Mantell collection which is at Te Papa Museum in New Zealand and also at the Natural History Museum in London. So these, these fossils could have been sent as early as 1819 by Gideon Mantell to Ethelred Bennett, according to his diary. So based on this, I've attributed the label in the top left to the Mantells. If you would like to learn more about the fossils of Folkestone, then you can buy my book from Siri Scientific Press, which is available online. Um, I should also say there are other books. There's a fantastic book from the Paleontological Association and there's also a fantastic book on the Galt Ammonites by Fred Clouter.
Here's just a few web links to other videos I have made on fossils of Folkestone and other fossil sites in Kent. Here's some acknowledgements uh, to people who have either provided me with photographs, information or access to specimens. Here's a few key references. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the talk.